Cross of Jesus, cross of sorrow. Let's stand to sing. And we'll sing all four verses. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we continue our studies in Acts chapter 9. Exciting passage of scripture. We see the call and the commissioning of the Apostle Paul. We see some exciting things in terms of what we are supposed to learn as believers from these incidents, things that affect our practical Christian life. Last week we looked at uh, verses 10 through 14, message entitled, When God Gives You a Nasty Job to Do. Ananias did not like the job that God gave to him, going to the Apostle Paul, who at that time was Saul the persecutor. Ananias knew about him, knew in fact not merely general things about him, which he had heard from many, but actually heard ahead of time that Paul had received a commission in Jerusalem to come to Damascus and put believers in jail. Rather interesting, there was a spy network among the Christians back then, even as there is now with the internet. We have a lot of information flowing very freely uh, and lots of things going on in the world. Tonight we want to talk about have you ever suffered for Jesus because God is going to tell Ananias that Paul is going to suffer. All over the world today there are believers who are suffering for their faith. Some are being tormented, some are being Persecuted by losing their jobs, others are being put in prison, and some, as we see recently in Saudi Arabia and other of the Arab nations, are being put to death because of their faith in Christ. Have you ever suffered for Jesus? Let's join in prayer first. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings on the Word of God as it goes forth tonight. We pray that it would not return void. We pray that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. It is your word, it is your power. We pray, Father, that you will cause us to take it, to learn it, to understand it, to believe it and to practice it, to be obedient to it, to be armed with the word of God, the only sword that you have given us in our spiritual armor, and that we might go forth as good soldiers of Jesus Christ into this world of darkness, carrying the light of the gospel to those who have not heard. Even as you commissioned Saul and named him Paul, even so you have commissioned us. We pray that you will make us faithful in the task to which you have called us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall last week as we looked at verses 9 through 14, we read, And Saul arose from the earth when his eyes were opened. He saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him 
into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias! And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarkus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave Ananias a job to do. Ananias balked at doing the job. How often you and I are given a job to do by our Lord Jesus Christ Clear instructions given in the word of God, and yet we resist doing what God has called us to do. We noted that there are four different kinds of jobs that God gives to people. There are jobs that we enjoy from the very outset, and we never get tired of doing those jobs. There are jobs that we wish that we had that other people have, and those are those easy jobs, the well-paying jobs, the jobs that have honor and so forth. Then we saw there are two negative kinds of jobs. There are jobs that we're glad that other people have that we don't have. And finally, there are jobs that we wish we didn't have to do, but we got assigned to do them anyway. And you know, as we look at that text there in Acts 9, verses 9 through 14, we learn that most of the jobs that we get are in the last two categories, and they're assigned by God for seven different purposes. One to develop our character. Two, to accomplish his purposes that are unknown to us. Three, to prove that he can use the most inadequate instruments for the most incredible ends. Four, to glorify himself, not the man that is used to do the job. Five, to teach us faith and obedience and how to overcome our fears. Six, to force us to interact with other believers whom we would rather not interact with. Definitely Ananias did not want to interact with Saul. And finally, to give a spectacular reward to the man who obediently and faithfully does the job that God called him to do. We saw that most of those things were present in the assignment that God gave to Paul and Ananias. We learned often that new believers are more willing to obey than long-time believers. Saul, he was ready to obey. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Ananias was ready to argue, Lord, I've heard many things of this man. God gave Ananias specific instructions accompanied by detailed information and based on specific authority, and Ananias balked. Our authority base is the Bible. How often do we balk at doing the will of God? Last week I gave you an assignment right at the very end of the message where we all stopped and took a little pop quiz. Uh, the assignment was stop and write down three specific commands that immediately come to your mind that God has given. And we noted that if you can't think of anything, probably one of the following things is true of you. Number one, you're not a believer. Number two, you are a believer, but you have not been walking in fellowship with the Lord. Number three, perhaps you're a believer, but you've not been studying the scripture, which is full of God's commands and prohibitions. Fourth, perhaps you have been ignoring what you read. You read it mindlessly as you go from text to text. And five, sometimes the reason we can't think of anything to do is because we're believers who are filled with fear rather than are filled with faith. So each of you has that list. I hope that this week God impressed on your heart whatever it was that he brought to your mind at that time to begin to work on it in your walk of Christian faith. So tonight we look at verses 15 and 16. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Amazing. 
You know, the very first command that Jesus gives to Ananias after he's given him his initial assignment, the very first command is, stop arguing. Just obey me. You know, I've raised 13 children with the help of my dear wife. And that is one of the things that we as parents ran into over and over and over. Children who, though they have few years of experience, insist that they want to argue because they have a different way of doing things. Now, all those children are very bright, and we recognize that. But we also understand that we as parents have been given authority by God. And so when we tell them to do something, what we want is obedience and not argumentation. How interesting it is, and I'm sure most of you have had that kind of an experience. That is the way our Lord is. When he tells us to do something, he wants us to obey and not to argue. And so the first thing that Jesus tells him after the, the long litany of problems that Ananias brings out, the Lord said unto him, go thy way. Get your feet moving in the right direction based on what you now know. Don't sit still, get it done. You know, you can never do the will of God if your feet are not moving. And you can never do the will of God if your feet are moving in the wrong direction. Think of Jonah. Jonah was called to go to Nineveh. Jonah's feet began moving, but his feet began moving in the wrong direction. Now, you know, friends, God will accomplish through you his perfect plan, regardless of whether you like it or not. God got Jonah's feet moving in the right direction with a very uncomfortable trip in the belly of the great fish. God made sure that Jonah showed up at Nineveh. You and I need to learn that when Jesus tells us to do something in his word, our obligation is obedience, not argumentation. The second thing that we note from our text tonight is God makes choices that we would not make, for he is a chosen vessel. A vessel carries something. God is going to give Paul a message to carry. Paul is going to have to carry that message to a very diverse group of people that are listed for us in the text. Gentiles, kings, the people of Israel. Paul is going to carry a message. He's a chosen vessel. The vessel does not have the right to determine what kind of vessel it is, nor what will be put into it. The Apostle Paul makes that clear in Romans chapter 9. God is the potter, we are the vessels. God puts into the vessel that which he wants for the vessel to carry. We are under obligation to carry it, whether it be precious jewels or whether we be a wastebasket that carries out the trash. God determines what kind of vessel we will be and God gives us an assignment by his choice, not by our choice. He is a chosen vessel. You know, when God makes choices that we would not make, he often chooses vessels that we think are inadequate or not fitting for the job. Did you know that's how all of us are, according to Paul, in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28? But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. You see, the reason God does that is so that no flesh will glory in his presence. God makes choices that you and I would not make. Listen to what James says, James 2.5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Not a matter of how much money you have, not a matter of how brilliant you are, not a matter of how much education you have. It's a matter of God choosing, and God chooses the weak vessels. The majority of believers in the world today are poor. You and I have the great blessing of living in a country where even the poorest are wealthy by world standards. But God hath chosen the poor of this world who are rich in something else, 
rich in faith. God chooses unlikely candidates for specific purposes, sometimes even for condemnation. Jesus speaking in Matthew 20 says, The last shall be first, and the first last for many be called, but few chosen. In chapter 22, verse 14, he says it again, For many are called, but few are chosen. Mark 13, 20, And except the Lord had shortened the days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And you'll notice that the context is in the midst of suffering. Here's a choice you and I probably would not have made. John 6, 70. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He says it again in John 13, verse 18. I speak not of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Jesus chose Judas. Judas was chosen for a specific task for which Judas would be condemned. That's a scary thought. Jesus could have chosen someone else, but Jesus chose Judas. And Judas, according to Scripture, has his own very special place in hell, in Tartarus. Scary thought. God makes choices that you and I would not make. He chooses those whom we would not choose. John 15, 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. He chose us, we didn't choose him. He's the one who sets the rules, and he's the one who has ordained that we should go and bear fruit. John 15, as you know, is that passage dealing with the fruit in the life of the believer, which Paul picks up in Galatians 5 with the fruit of the Spirit. And we find all the fruit of the Spirit listed for us in that first passage spoken by Jesus in John chapter 15. Though Paul did not hear that, yet it was revealed to him. Fantastic choices Jesus made. Verse 19, he says, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore... The world hateth you. We have been chosen, not merely to bear fruit, but we have been chosen out of the world as distinct from the world so that the world might see the difference and understand who Jesus is. You and I, if we've trusted in Christ, are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. You and I are the ones who bear the light outside of Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. The temple was in Jerusalem. The temple has been destroyed. And now God has chosen a new temple to carry his light to the nations. He has ordained us and chosen us out of the world. Very interesting. That's where we pick up the book of Acts. Verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen. And by the way, you know, as I think about that verse, it's not chosen merely because these were the guys who happened to be available and there was nobody else that was, you know, yeah, well, I guess we'll have to be stuck with these guys. These men were chosen before the world began. So that means that God made sure in the direction of their conception and their birth and their timing in history so that those 12 men would be men, and not little boys or old men about to die, that they would be right there at that point of history, in the fullness of time, when God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that at that particular time in history, God would have these 12, because they were chosen vessels to bear his name. That tells me something else about us. God has ordained our lives at this point of history because we are also, as we will see, chosen vessels to bear his name. 
God has set us at this point, at this time, at this occurrence of history, with the interactions that we individually and personally have, divine appointments that we've seen already as we saw with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, precise timing of events so that we might fulfill his purposes and do his will. That's exciting. That means that God has a special plan for you. God has a special plan for me. God has situations in which he places us so that we will be his light to those who have not heard. I hope that excites you. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful blessing. That means we have a God who is directing things for his glory and for our good and for our blessing. But there's that little problem of suffering along the way, which we'll see in just a moment. We find in Acts chapter 1, verse 24, there was another man who would have to take the place of Judas. And they weren't just sort of, you know, counting eeny, meeny, miny, mo. They were asking for God's direction and listen to what they prayed. They prayed and said, Lord, thou, which hast, that knowest the hearts of all men, show whither of these two thou hast chosen. When you begin to look at this in scripture, you discover it all over. God is the one who makes the choices. We are the ones to whom the responsibilities are committed. And then God, though he does the work through us, in the end gives us rewards. And then we realize, this is not what I have done. These crowns, these stephanoi that God has given to us, don't belong to us because he did it through us. And we take them from our heads and we cast them at the feet of Christ. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us unto God by his blood to receive honor and glory and power and riches and blessing. The crowns belong to Christ. He hath on his head many crowns, the book of Revelation tells us. They are all things that he did through us. We've been chosen to witness, Acts 10, 41, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. We are chosen to know the will of God. And he said, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one and should hear the voice of his mouth. We are chosen to salvation in eternity past, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love having predestinated us. Second Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. He's chosen all of us to do battle in the spiritual warfare. Second Timothy 2.4 No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We've been chosen for a specific purpose as a royal priesthood. 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Chosen. Paul was a chosen vessel. You and I are chosen vessels as well. The second thing we learn in our text is that we are personal unto him. He has chosen unto me. Jesus is speaking to Ananias, telling Ananias about Saul. He has chosen unto me. Christ has chosen us for himself, not merely to do nasty jobs. The reason he gives us the responsibilities that he gives us is because he loves us. We are his. Oh, I wish we could talk about Ephesians chapter 1 and all the times that it speaks of us being in Christ. It talks about our position in the beloved, in him. The third thing that we learn from the text is all of us have been chosen to bear his name. There is that phrase, to bear my name. 
We all bear the name of Christian. This morning we talked about that just briefly as we were going through the names of God. We've been chosen to bear his name. How are we bearing it? James asks the question in James 2, 7, Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? We bear a name. Are we causing the name of Christ to be blasphemed because we bear his name? How do we live before the watching world? It's rather interesting, that business of being called by the name of Christ. There's a special word used. We see it first in Acts 11.26, where you are given a name based on your principal occupation. A man, for example, by the name of Baker had ancestors who were probably bakers. A man by the name of Butler had an ancestor who was probably a butler. A man by the name of Cooper probably had an ancestor who was a barrel maker. Names that were given in history that have descended to us today, but names that were based on a chief occupation. We find this world word called, which means given a name based on a chief occupation, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Listen to this. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Called Christians. They were given a name based upon their chief occupation of being Christians. That same word is used very, very strikingly over in Romans chapter 7. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called, given a name based on her chief occupation, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man. To remarry while a former spouse is alive, God says you are given a name based on your chief occupation, the habitual thing that you do day by day, that is, commit adultery. The fifth thing that we discover is our target group before whom we bear his name will vary. The phrase Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. We could spend some time on that, but we move on because there are many other things I want to talk about in relation to suffering. But who is the target group before whom you must bear his name? Whether we like it or not, we are his witnesses. Jesus said so in Acts chapter 1, you're my witnesses. You know, whether we like it or not, we're it. And you're going to witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. Wherever we go, we bear the name of Christ. Who is the target group to whom God has sent you as his witness? Sent you to bear his name. He must bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The sixth thing we learn out of this text is God's choice of vessels and assignments is so that not only he can use us, but so that he can teach us something. Look at that phrase, for I will show him. Why did God put you at this particular point in history? Well, we know that he loves us. We know that he's doing good for us. Had he chosen to put us at some other point of history, it would have been for a, a specific purpose. But what we discover here is that he put us here now so that he could teach us something. He is interested in our spiritual growth. He is interested in us understanding his will. He is interested in us obeying his will. Because that's what brings him glory and that's what brings joy to our hearts when we accomplish what God has called us to do. For I will show him. What is God trying to teach you 
as you look at your life and as you look at the events of your life and as you look at the intersections of your life with others and as you look at the Word of God which God has given you the privilege of studying, what is God trying to teach you? Now we get to the main point for tonight. God, in His sovereign will, appoints some to great suffering. But he appoints all of us to some suffering if we're walking by faith and obeying him. Look at that phrase. How great things he must suffer. It applies to all of us. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Dear friends, if you've never suffered anything for Jesus, perhaps it's because you are not living godly in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say, all that believe the true things in their heart but don't let anybody know will suffer persecution. We're so focused on making sure that we have precisely accurate right doctrine. But we don't want it to show on the outside. He says, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Have you ever suffered for Jesus? Most of us here in America have not. Very, very little suffering. For Jesus. It's like the old question, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? How many of us have the clear evidence in our life of living godly that it has brought about the suffering of persecution? The purpose of suffering is for the name of Christ. Remember, that's the context that the Lord is speaking to Ananias and telling him about the suffering that Paul will have to have. It will be for the name of Jesus. Most of us suffer not for the name of Christ, but we suffer merely because we're obnoxious and stupid. That's not the reason to suffer. It says, for my name's sake, I will teach him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Too often we suffer for our own stupidity, sin, and obnoxious attitudes. How did the believers of the early church view suffering? Well, we find it in Acts chapter 5, verse 41. They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. When we have a little bit of suffering come into our lives, do we rejoice in it? Is the suffering because we have stood up for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do we rejoice that we are committed, are counted worthy to suffer for shame for his name? Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, what a position. Listen to the last half of the verse. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. This is not a happy kind of a message to preach. You know, we love the, those first halves of the verses. We love the first half of Hebrews chapter 11, all the great things that the heroes of faith accomplished. We try to shut out the last half of Hebrews chapter 11, but others. And it talks about all those who suffered because they were men and women of faith. Hear what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 12, and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. Chapter 12, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Do you realize that when another believer is suffering, 
You, because you are part of the body of Christ, are also suffering. And he goes on and he gives great illustration in 1 Corinthians 12 about hands and feet and eyes and nose and ears. And you don't say when you stub your toe, ah, oh, that's the toe. And it's only an inch long. Look at me, I weigh 200 pounds. Do I worry about my toe? No, I don't worry about my toe. That's not the way the body acts. When the toe gets hurt, the entire body hurts. The entire body weeps. Do you weep for your brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering, even though at this moment you perhaps are not? If we would understand God's perspective on who we are and how we are joined to Christ, and what is going on in the body of Christ with both honor and suffering, and how our Lord identifies with it, and because we are part of his body, we should identify with it too. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is, the effect, is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. The Apostle Paul is practically applying what he had just taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to those at Corinth who had heard his writing and now he's saying, here's how it works out in my life in relation to you. Galatians chapter 6 verse 12, and as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. That's the compromisers. That's the ones who want to follow the middle road where they don't take a stand for Christ, where it's clear and distinct from their culture around them. They're not willing to suffer. Philippians 1.29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, there's your true doctrine, but also to suffer for his sake. I hope you understand, folks, this is all over the New Testament. This is the part that we don't like to listen to very often. This is, unfortunately, what we've got all together tonight. Listen to what Paul says to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass, and ye know. God gives us fair warning. God brought this message tonight for us here to give us fair warning. 2 Thessalonians 1.5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Dear friends, we don't know what's going to happen here in the United States. We know that there are bad things happening now. We know that there are bad things that are planned to be happening. We know that there are certain people at different levels of government in different places that hate Christians. We know that simply because we can see various lawsuits going on. We can see various executive orders being given. We can see things happening at the federal, the county, the state, the municipal level by people who are deliberately attempting to put Christians into a corner. How that will play out, we don't know. Only the mercy of God can deliver us from it. But the Apostle Paul says that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Listen to what he writes to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Malista, that is, that's a special word that means, by that I mean to say, those that believe. Second Timothy 1.12, For the which cause I suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded, that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. When you get into the times of suffering, what are you supposed to fall back on? You know whom you have believed. You've already committed unto him everything against that day when we shall see him. Second Timothy 1.12 For the which cause I also suffer these things. 
suffer these things. Second Timothy 2.9, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. You know, you're going to be accused of false things. Our Lord was. You look throughout the history of Scripture and you find many people accused of false things. The Lord Jesus Christ put it this way. You know, if they've said the Master's demon-possessed, what are they going to say about you guys? If they've accused Christ, who lived a perfect life and only taught the truth and never did wrong, if they accused him and crucified him and you follow him, do you expect anything different? Second Timothy 2.12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Hebrews 13.3 Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. Back to the principle that Paul gave in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we are part of the same body. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Genuine, true, sound doctrine results in a godly lifestyle. A godly lifestyle results in persecution. That's the way the scripture ties it together. But the question of suffering must focus around our faith in Christ. Suffering as a Christian, not just for our own stupidity. 1 Peter 2, 19 and 20. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faith ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. If somebody beats you up because of your faults, for the stupid things that you do, it's no big deal, says Peter. But if you suffer as a Christian, that's acceptable with God. He says that over in 1 Peter 3.14, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Down to verse 17, for it is better if the will of God be so. Remember, it was the will of God that Paul should suffer. Not merely to suffer, but with Paul to suffer great suffering. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. But let none of you, 1 Peter 4.15, suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. When it comes, how are we supposed to respond? Three verses later, Peter tells us. 1 Peter 4.19 Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of of God, commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well doing, as unto a faithful Creator. He takes you back to creation. He takes you back to the responsibility that you have, no matter what circumstances are around you. If you are suffering, According to the will of God, what you do, you commit your soul to God and then you do well. You do what is right. You continue to live a godly life. Think of Daniel. Here's Daniel. He hears the decree of the king. The king says, anybody who prays to another god is going to get the axe. After he heard that command, what did he do? Same thing he'd always done before. He opened his windows. He could have left them closed. And he prayed toward Jerusalem to the true and living God. And of course his enemies saw him. They were looking for him. If you suffer according to the will of God, you commit your soul to him, and then you do right because he is the faithful creator. He is the one who started all things he is the one who will end all things. It is to him that we must give an account 
It doesn't matter what people think or what people say. Commit your soul to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. James says we've got some examples that we can follow. James 5.10, take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. You look back at the Old Testament prophets. Oh, how few of them ever got the kudos of their day. How often those prophets were persecuted and tormented and slain who shored before the coming of that just one, our Lord Jesus Christ. James says, take them for an example. You say, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is unique to me. No, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. You've got an example. You've got the prophets who've gone before as an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. That's the others of Hebrews chapter 11. What is the results, the final end results of our suffering? We find it illustrated for us in Revelation chapter 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the grace that you give to us and for the goal that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the goal that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye become wearied and faint in your minds. Father, help us to gird up the loins of our mind. Help us to run with patience the race that is set before us, Help us, Father, to day by day consider the example of the prophets, those who spoke the truth, those who lived the truth, those who were unashamed of the God of Scripture. Make us bold men and women of God who hold forth the word of life without flinching, regardless of what the world says, regardless of what the world does to us. Help us to be faithful unto death, and we shall receive a crown of life which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not unto me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. Make us your people, for we are chosen vessels to bear your name. In Jesus' name.